Hello, my lovely audience. Today we are going to be learning some flash tricks that I have like picked up on during the years. Uh, I'm going to be basing this of a comp simulation round that I did with Cordelia and uh, some of the, the, the women trying to prepare for the Swedish championship coming up quite soon. And uh, we're starting off on a slab climb that was in the round that proved to be very difficult and required a lot of thinking for them to figure out. Uh, there was, it's very confusing and it's definitely one that's good to prepare a flash burn for because you, you, you can just f fiddle around on it for so long and waste so, many of, so much of your time if you're doing this on a comp. I'll put uh, some timestamps for you all to you know, click through if you want to focus on something else, but I'd prefer it if you watched all of the video because that would make me be able to do more of these videos in the future. So hit the thumbs up if you do enjoy it. Let's get started. On this specific boulder, there's a lot of different foot options that you have to take uh, into account. Most specifically, there's a variation between these really, really tricky jibs that don't give you anything because they have a dual textured surface, they're pointy. You can find these outdoors as well. Like this is just a very specific type of foothold that requires a very specific type of shoe. But this climb is also coupled with a lot of volume smearing. So you have to stand on these boxes. And for volume smearing, you want a softer shoe. But for these type of edges, a stiff shoe is quite essential. And currently I'm wearing my competition shoes. These are perfect for basically everything except for these small footholds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to either my very, very stiff shoes that don't bend, you know, if I even hammer them, like they are stuck like that, so I can stand on anything with them. Or I switch to my semi soft shoes. These are like, they, they give some flexibility, which is quite good for smearing on boxes but they are rigid enough to give me a lot of support on these smaller footholds. So, which one do I choose? The one in the middle. This one is gonna be the best on this type of climb, and I'm assessing this because I know that I'm gonna to wanna to stand on a foothold here or here, which is gonna require a lot of tension for my foot, but then also at the end of the boulder, I know I'm gonna to have to use my right foot on a very, very sloping box. So I would prefer to have my softer shoe there, but since I need to have another one here, I'll start off with a stiffer one in the beginning and then uh, use that for my flash burn to make sure that I'm, you know, set for the entire climb. <sighs> See, if I had a softer shoe right now, the support I would get here would be so much worse. But because I have a stiff shoe, I can move comfortably. That's the box I want to land on. So I want to have a, a soft one there. But what I have is the stiff one, but it's going to be enough because it's just soft enough to smear on a box. But I'll still have to apply a lot of pressure on the right hand. And there, I know that it's going to smear out. So I'm trying to like pull down my heel and apply a lot of pressure from both the hand and the foot. There we go. I mean, these aren't flashes because I was a part of setting this, but you know, the point still comes across and it's relevant for the lessons that we're gonna learn in the rest of this episode. What you'll notice quite quickly here is uh, the difference in mine and climbing and Cordy's climbing style is that I'm very assertive and I know what I'm doing. I mean, again, I have already climbed it, so of course I can be more confident, but the confidence I get from knowing which shoes I'm wearing and specifying why I'm wearing them helps a lot with just trusting your feet and trusting your ability to stay on the wall. So that's why I'm so deliberate with the shoes that I wear because I know like, oh, I've chosen this shoe for this specific purpose on this boulder. And so I know it's gonna stick. Okay, moving on to the next one. This is like a classic coordination dyno that we all know and love. This one has a very specific flash lesson. And this is about intent of movement and visualization. One of the big things with any climbing that we do is understanding how your change in body position will affect your hands, your legs, your limbs, your everything. And on coordination dynos, we learn that more thoroughly than on anything else. I mean, when we're climbing statically, we know that we're gonna stick on the wall, we just, we know how things are gonna progress. But when I'm swinging off a jug, you know, I, who knows where I'm gonna land. And if you can visualize that in advance, it will help you a lot in your flash skills. And so training to visualize how your body position will move on a coordination dyno is just a fantastic way to progress both as a flash climber, but also as a climber in general who's trying to red point because you're learning to understand how changes in your body's uh, mechanics and, and just where you are in the, <laughs> on the boulder, just understanding how that, those changes affect you will help you on any type of movement. That's the point of this one. We visualize exactly how 
our bodies will move. So with this specific move, I'm trying to be very intentional to how my swing will affect the way that my body progresses on the wall. And what I want to shoot for is to understand like how will I make my legs give me enough momentum to move into this corner. This means that I'll want my leg to swing from basically like here straight out and control the momentum from that position. Okay, so for the keen observer, you'll notice that I kept wearing my stiffer shoe, semi-stiff shoe on the right shoe, and I kept the left shoe to be a softer one. There was a intense foothold right here, which would require a little bit more support. And also that all of the volumes that you're standing on are pretty massive. So you don't really need like the most epic smearing shoe ever. I could do, use something that's in between and it would work just fine. Those are some lessons from this one. Now let's do some power climbing. Okay, this is my favorite style of climbing to address because it's so relevant that you're deliberate with what you're doing when you're doing powerful style of climbing. You usually have only a few attempts. Realistically, if, as, if a powerful boulder is at your physical limit, you do it on the first or second attempt of the day. And because of that, it's very important to train powerful style of climbing indoors with intent. For instance, when I when I did both Story and Two Worlds and my first 8B called The Queen Mother, they're both quite power endurance climbs and I would not have more than two or three good attempts per day before I was screwed. So I need every single attempt to matter and really perfect it as much as possible because otherwise I'm wasting too much energy. And that's why on this type of climb, you know, we can practice it quite deliberately. And we say, if it's something that's at your physical limit to flash, you make sure that you're very, very, like you make sure that you don't try and spend several attempts on it. On powerful climbs, we want to execute right away every single move to as much perfection as we possible, possibly can. And by that, I mean, we envision that we don't have more than one attempt. We can't waste moves. We have to try really freaking hard to make sure we don't waste anything. So what I do, for instance, in competitions, I don't do more than two, sometimes three attempts in a five minute uh, period on a powerful boulder. Even if I just make it one or two moves in, I don't spend any more than that. I rest for two minutes because you need a lot of time to recover. That helps me train for flashing. That helps me train for deliberate climbing on powerful terrain. So that's what we're going to do with this one because uh, in the competition, Cordy did flash it and you can see very clearly that when she moves throughout the boulder, it is with very specific intent. Like she is not allowing yourself to drop down and relax and take it chill because none of the positions allowed her to do so. So she keeps on pushing, keeps on pushing until she gets to the top. And uh, we're gonna do the same, but from a cooler angle when I do it now. <laughs> This method works really well on this type of climb oh. where oh, every single position is quite hard. You don't really get any form of position where you can rest. And if you do rest, you don't recover. <laughs> you just mentally reset more so than anything. But we have one more powerful climb that was in the competition uh, with these black holds um, that took Cordy a few attempts, if I remember correctly. And, and in the next climb, we're gonna have a look at how you can, on a powerful climb, also focus a lot on recovery instead of just trying hard because they are there is a sort of synergy you shouldn't always give 100 percent on every single powerful climb but that comes back to everything that we've talked about earlier visualizing planning and then executing like when we combine all of this well that's when we get to the last one because on this one 
as you can see when Cordy is climbing it, it's a lot of these positions are actually positions where you don't have to be so tense. Even in the first one where you're establishing, you're in a tow hook and you basically just hang like a banana. And if you tense everything up, well, that's not really gonna help you. And same goes throughout the climb. Uh, and since it is, all of the moves are physical. So moving between holds is hard. But the point is that when you don't have to move between a hold, you can actually relax and, and kind of let go of that tension. But this thing is, the thing with that is, if you don't plan that in advance, there's no chance that you're gonna make good use of them. You might be resting a little bit, but in those positions, you should be focusing on being completely relaxed. You should basically be able to chalk up and take a deep breath and recover because soon a hard move will follow. And this is the really tricky part about powerful climbing is understanding the, the pacing where it comes to trying hard and not trying hard. And uh, on this type of climb where there's a lot of toe hooks, a lot of heel hooks, that's where I would say, I find it the easiest to figure out of these, these positions. So yeah, let's have a look at how it looks when I climb on it and make good use of all of these more relaxed positions to recover for the next powerful move. That's how it looks, my friends, when I try and flash boulders. Again, I've already climbed them because I set them, but I think all of the points that I presented here are stuff that I would apply if this was in a flash format where I was trying to do these on the first attempt. So I hope you all took some lessons from it. We've learned how to apply, you know, theory crafting with shoes and which ones to use on different climbs. We've looked a little bit at how you can visualize movement in order to succeed better at your flashing. We've looked at how you try really freaking hard with the purpose of not falling, with intent of not falling because you don't have enough power to afford it. You have to do everything you can to succeed right away. And we've talked about how you use all of these three to figure out the best ways to not waste energy when you're trying hard. Um, yeah, I hope you liked this video. If you did enjoy it, please subscribe to the channel. And yeah, I guess that's it. Peace out, my homies.